I'm going to talk about uh, artisan cheese challenges and opportunities, and hopefully it'll generate a few questions um, at the end of the session. Um, no. Now, for some reason, my <laughs> let's try again. Oh, no. Okay, sorry about that. Technical problems. So the aims of the session today are to identify the main challenges that the cheesemaker has, and to have a look at how we can um, monitor those and, and make changes. So reviewing those factors. Um, we'll have a look at the ripening process and the products of ripening and how, again, these we will affect the product that we have. And then at the end, we'll have a look at some of the opportunities that are available to the artisan cheesemaker. So I'm starting with just an overview of cheese manufacture. So just a very basic one. Um, and I've done, um, I've gone through hard, hard cheese but actually um, quite a lot of the phases are common to both hard and soft cheese. So the, the, um, the sort of brownie colored ones um, will occur in soft cheese uh, only, um, oh, sorry, it will only occur in soft cheese, whilst the blue ones will occur only in hard cheese. Um, and moving on from that, I've, I've then highlighted um, where we have um, challenges and we'll have a look at those in more detail. So things like the starter, um, how the variety, um, the activity and farge will affect it, um, how coagulation is so paramount to um, any type of cheese making. And to be honest, it's an area that even the most ex experienced cheese makers struggle with because it can change on a daily daily basis. Um, then we'll move into cutting and how minuscule differences in cutting can affect the product that you're making. Um, and on into um, scalding if you're making a hard cheese. And actually, even sometimes in a soft cheese, a very, a very slight scald can be used. Um, and then through into texturing and how that will affect your, your curd and, and thus your, your product. Um, and then salting, uh, which you'll hear me say later, is a massive thing for artisan cheesemakers. It's the biggest cause of um, failures in, in cheeses that I judge. Artisan cheese, cheeses is um, the salt content. And then finally on to maturing the cheese um, and, and selecting it at the right time. <clears throat> So we're going to cover those areas in more detail as we go through. I apologize for my croaky voice. Um, I don't know, quite know what's happened overnight. Another technical hitch. So um, if we look at the factors influencing cheese quality, um, the milk quality is obviously paramount. And I know you've had uh, other sessions on milk quality. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that um, homogenization is uh, a, an important area. Um, and for artisan cheese makers, it, it's a particular um, problem because sometimes you're buying milk in from a dairy um, and those dairies don't understand that homogenization is something that can actually have a big impact in our product. And so I know a number of artisan cheesemakers locally who buy milk in um, and the, the, the companies they buy it from homogenize the milk or put it through a, a homogenizer with no pressure on, which still causes an issue. And the reason for that is that homogenization is disrupting the casein and so it's actually um, damaging the coagulation process. Um, if you're making low fat cheeses, then homogenization is not such a problem. Um, but if you're making um, an unstandardized uh, normal fat cheese, then 
you really have to be very careful about the, the source of your milk to avoid having homogenized uh, or, or even um, non-pressure homogenized milk going through. Um, secondly, the, the next important factor that's influencing your quality is your, is your starter choice um, and also the starter quality. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that um, later. Um, and clearly the coagulation quality is, is paramount as well. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. And then within that, it's, it's all about knowing when to start each step. And uh, whilst today I'm talking to artisan cheesemakers, uh, I, I do a lot of sessions with um, big cheese companies, very big cheese companies, international ones that um, have continuous processes. And even then, um, they, they, the, the, the operators need to be able to understand the, the milk and the curd so that they can know that they're, they're, they're working, the pressing the buttons at the right time, basically. Um, so the first challenge is the starter. Um, when I first started making cheese, basically we all used the first three species, the Lactococcus lactis subspecies lactis, subspecies Cremoris, and subspecies Lactis var diacetylactis. Um, and those, those were really the only ones that everybody used. Um, we obviously had to have starter rotations. Uh, and there are there are, as you'll see on the next slide, there are other other starters that might have been used. But now we've got lots of other starters that we're bringing in. And the biggest the big, biggest change has been the use of the Lactobacillus helveticus to give sweet cheddars. I know some of my judging um, uh, partners have a hatred of sweet cheddars, but they are a product that the that the customer likes, and uh, I have no problem with sweet cheddars. Um, and the reason we can get those is by incorporating um, Lactobacillus helveticus and similar Lactobacilli in the starter mix. So they're a reasonably new um, uh, part of the starter mix. Um, other starters that we put in might be things like uh, Leuconostoc mesenteroides, which is used in some blue cheeses. And that's used to put a small amount of carbon dioxide into the curd, which gives a slightly more open texture and allows the blue mold to, to grow. And then finally, um, if we've got high scold cheeses, we need um, heat resistant species, thermophilic species, um, that will grow during the high scold. So I've got a list of some of the starters here and we'll just have a look at, at um, what these uh, might be used for. <coughs> so we've got the, uh, the three traditional ones there, the Lactis cremoris and Diacetylactis. The, um, I'm sure you know this, but um, Diacetylactis uh, is a, a variant of uh, Lactococcus lactis subspecies lactis, which is able to ferment citrate. And that gives you this um, buttery flavor of diacetyl. So it is important and it's, it's usually used just to balance the flavor out. Um, then, as I mentioned, we've got Leuconostoc mesenteroides, um, subspecies Cremoris used to give a little bit of carbon dioxide to push open the curd. Um, Propionibacterium shimanii is used in um, Emmental and uh, continental style cheeses to give the eye holes. Quite a tricky uh, starter to work with. To um, Streptococcus citrivorum. Uh, is used to ferment citrate to give fresh starters, uh, fresh cheeses. And then the I mentioned the thermophiles. So Streptococcus thermophilus 
is actually a yogurt startup. It's used in a lot of high school cheeses, such as um, some of the continentals and uh, Parmesan cheese. Um, and then another, that's another um, uh, thermoduric is uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus, another yogurt starter, similar use. Uh, and finally, Lactobacillus helveticus for sweet cheddars. So one of the um, one of the important things with starter is managing the um, system to avoid um, bacteriophage attack. It's it is an issue for artisan cheesemakers because of having sufficient small amounts of starter, um, so that we um, what tends to happen is we have a bag of starter and we want to use it, uh, but you have to. Um, rotate your starter because if you don't, phage will develop for, for your starter um, and it will damage the, um, the starter. And I have had this problem with artisan cheesemakers where, where they've, they've carried on using their bag of starter and then suddenly the cheese isn't working properly. Um, and so if you see any type of slowness, you need to get rid of the starter and, and open a, a, a new a new one uh, of a, a slightly different mix of microorganisms. Um, it's, um, I, I do understand the problems there for you, uh, that, that, that you know, you want to use your starter up and not waste it, but, um, you know, it, we have to be aware of the problems. So uh, I've done a quick, um, explanation, a, a very simple explanation of what's happening with um, bacteriophage. Um, and you should be able to see my slightly odd diagram there. Um, so on the left hand side of the screen, I've got a phage that's landed on a, on a bacterial cell. Um, and if the uh, lock and key theory is working, so it's got the, the key to, the, to, to that particular cell wall. It will inject its um, nucleic acid um, and that nucleic acid will take over the DNA of the bacterium and break it down and reform it to make lots of um, virions, baby phages, um, and they uh, are identical to the to the original phage, uh, and will and produce an enzyme to break down the cell wall, and then they all shoot off to infect something else. And within that, you can then get mutations, so you get different phages formed. Um, you might have one with a different coloured uh, from my diagram um, nucleic acid. So it's just a slight change in there. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, that then is killing that cell. Now, when that happens, um, you get something like, well, more than 50 phage per cell. And so you can see how that will explode so rapidly. And the electron microgram, micrograph on the right hand side shows a bacterial cell with phages in, the, in, in it. And you can see there are there are dozens in there. So very quickly, um, once you've got phage in there, it will take over and it will kill your, your starter. And so it's essential to, to, um, to, to keep changing that. <clears throat> so um, the next challenge then is, is coagulation. And I'll just quickly go through the coagulation. Um, if we if we look at the casein micelle at the bottom there, um, the, the casein micelle is lots of different caseins, but on the outside we have the kappa casein, and um, Rennet works by just cutting off um, part of the kappa casein, and so it destabilizes the the kappa casein and causes um, the casein micelles to clump together. Um, and as you can see here, I'll just, no, oh, sorry. Um, 
sorry about that. Um, it works at position 105 and 106 on the kappa casein chain. So it only works at that point. And that's the link between phenylalanine and methionine amino acids. It won't happen anywhere else. And it cuts off the end. Um, and that is the para-kappa casein um, um, remaining with the, with the, with the actual micelle. Um, so what happens then is the, the phosphorus ions join onto the um, para-kappa casein and a calcium ion links them together. And so we get this network of um, casein micelles. And that network is then trapping in the, the, the rest of the components. Um, so it's a really crucial part of the uh, process and something that I see um, most affects the quality of, of a cheese. Very often, um, overpasteurization is one of the problems. Um, and overpasteurization um, is a big problem now, nowadays because of the issues we have with um, mycobac mycobacterium paratuberculosis. Um, everybody's increased pasteurization time and temperature to um, kill that organism because it's more heat resistant. But also then what's happening is that's um, given us a weaker casein um, because we're de depositing some and we're depositing some calcium on the plates. So um, we, we try to get uh, the whey proteins retained um, and it can he help with that, but it, it, um, it will give us a problem with, with the firmness of the, of the coagulum. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so be very careful. Uh, in fact, um, tr cheese making traditionally didn't use a full pasteurization. Um, so it's another problem with buying buying milk in that they'll use a higher pasteurization. With with um, with cheese making, we've got other control factors for the mycobacterium. But um, if you're buying your milk in, you, you're, you haven't got that control factor. Um, homogenization, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that it will give us a, a weaker coagulum. So we need to be careful with that. Um, and then the final one is, is thinking about um, when, we're, when we're coagulating, the rennet works better in a slightly acid um, state. So pH is important. Um, and that's the, there's actually quite a, a tight relationship there, which I haven't illustrated, but um, usually we have a, a slight ripening time just to help the pH um, develop slightly. Having said that, modern rennets are, are much better than they, than they used to be. So um, pH is less of a problem than, than, um, than it used to be. Um, fact, fact to casein ratio um, is, I, I, I'm only going to mention it to a, a small amount, but um, it gives us some control over the body of the cheese. So it, it's often done in large cheese makers um, and not so much so with artisan cheese makers. Um, if you have a high butterfat, you will get a slightly weaker bodied cheese. Um, and um, similarly, if you've got a low butter fat, as we all know with low fat cheeses, you can get a much more brittle cheese. And so uh, the way around this is actually to standardize the fat to casein ratio. Um, and different companies do use different ratios, but roughly one to 0 0.7 for um, continuous and mechanical cheese making, and one to 0 0.68 for traditional methods. Um, and the way that, the, the problem with that is you have to know your fat and casein um, figures to be able to do it. 
Um, but if you do have that facility, then the way is normally by adding either a small amount of cream or separating um, to reduce some of the fat to give you the right ratio. Um, it, it helps you to maintain an even ratio across the season, um, because as we all know, uh, that's going to change the fat, the fat content changes during the year anyway. Um, so large cheesemakers use it to even out that. Uh, um, and you can get away without it, but if you if you know if you find you have a problem with um, slightly weaker bodied cheese due to fat, you know, if you're a Jersey producer, you might need to think about um, the fat to casein ratio. Um, the um, next challenge is, is cutting and, and it's it's selecting the right time. Um, so if you if you cut too soon, you'll you'll have a lot of curd losses and you'll have a very milky way um, and you'll end up with uh, a, an over acid weak curd uh, and you'll also lose a lot of salt. So you'll end up with um, ultimately a low salt cheese. So it is really important to get, get make sure you're not cutting too soon. And I have seen very big cheese makers with this problem. Um, if you cut too late, the, the curd becomes very hard um, and it will trap in um, lactose and it'll also give you an over acid curd. Uh, it won't give you the salt losses because the curd's stronger, but it will give you an over acid cheese in the end. Um, and of course, clearly the size of cut is going to affect the uh, lactose that remains in the curd. Um, and that's why the acidity uh, is, is um, increased in if we, if we don't get it absolutely spot on. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to check your curd because I'm sure you all know that. And once, if we're making a hard cheese or even some soft cheeses, the, once, we've, once we've done our cut uh, and allowed the curd particles to heal again, we'll move on into the scalding process. Now I mentioned that some soft cheeses do scald um, and it might only be half a degree, but it's enough just to um, shrink the curd slightly to control the acidity and also to give you a slightly um, um, better curd, better, more resistant curd, I think is the word I'm trying to use. Um, so clearly the scold temperature has a massive dif difference. And if we're making something like Parmesan, the scold can be up to 40 or even 41 uh, degrees C. Whereas um, with something like um, Stilton, uh, there's no scold whatsoever, but it's a very long uh, development overnight. Um, so it's a firm curd in the morning. So if we've got high scolds, we need the right starters that can that can put up with um, the temperatures. Um, and what is most important, and I, I don't see it so often nowadays, but um, if you if you scold too quickly, what will happen is you you cause case hardening and that will trap moisture within the curd. And so again, you get an over acid curd. And what we want to do is to do uh, a slow scold at the start so that the actual curd particles um, act like sponges and squeeze the moisture out of them. Um, I was always taught that you should raise the scold temperature by a third in two thirds of the time that you're allowing. So if you've got a six degree scold from 30 to 36, you'd go up um, a, a, over an hour. So you go up two degrees in 40 minutes and then the last four degrees in the last 20 minutes. And that will then mean that you, you, you're squeezing as much of the way out as you can do. <clears throat> Um, once we then move on into texturing, um, it, it does depend on the type of the cheese. But one of the one of the challenges to the small cheese maker is if you're making a cheddar type, 
um, you need the pressure to be able to get the correct chicken breast structure. Um, and, and often if you're making um, a small amount of cheese, that's something that you really struggle with. So it's finding a way to be able to stack your curd and apply a suitable pressure. Um, and it might be that you're using um, um, molds with hot water in or something like that, just, just to, or warm water in, just to be able to uh, weigh the curd down to get the squashing and elongation of the curd to give you the chicken breast structure. Um, so that that's quite common in, in small scale production. Um, clearly, if you're making um, similar non-cheddar hard cheeses, um, then you're, you're looking possibly for different types of texturing. Um, double gloss. So um, we're aiming to produce the chicken breast structure by squashing the curd. And um, if you've got a different uh, type of cheese, that process will be, will be subtly different. So you might need to dry stir to get rid of the whey um, and not squash it as much. Um, salting is, for me, the biggest challenge for um, modern cheesemakers. We've got internationally, um, we've got uh, non cheesemakers lobbying us to reduce the salt in cheese. We cannot reduce the salt very far because it is an essential part in the maturation process. It is a flavor enhancer. And if any of you have tasted unsalted or low salted cheeses, you will totally understand this. Um, it's, it is essential in helping uh, the breakdown of bitter peptides. And so if you've got low salt cheese, you will get a bitter cheese. Um, in blue cheeses, particularly, there's a tendency to bitterness. Sometimes that's because it's not old enough, because actually in blue cheese, as you'll see soon, it does pass through the, the bitter phase. So for me, the main aim is to get a low standard deviation on the salt content so we keep it uh, constant and that is a challenge because of moisture in our cheese. Um, there's been a lot of research in salt and even going back nearly 20 years um, Tim Guinea who's one of the leaders in this area from University College Cork um, showed that um, the, the three things that I've mentioned are in are really important. So it's it is a preservative, it's a flavor flavor contributor, but actually it is a source of uh, uh, dietary sodium if you eat a massive am amount of cheese. So possibly uh, contributes to my dietary so sodium, but um, it, most people don't eat enough for it to be a big issue. Um, so my focus is on the flavor contribution. Um, and we know that um, salt will help in the breakdown of peptides. Um, and the next slide shows this in, in more detail. But um, we go through, we know we go through um, digestion where, uh, where um, proteins are broken down to polypeptides and peptides. And actually bacteria are doing this in cheese as well. Um, as this slide shows, in, in blue cheeses, um, the salt's doubly important because um, penicillium rock fortii, which is usually used, is stimulated by salt in concentrations of up to 3%. So if we're below 1%, it's not working properly. Uh, and if we're over 3%, then it's also not working properly. But um, that means that we do have a fairly tight range that we need to keep that salt at. So there's, there's the, the process of proteolysis. Um, and you can see the, the rennet is um, affecting considerably 
um, and and used to give us real problems actually, but now vegetarian rennets are much better than they used to be. But we get to this point where we have bitter peptides, and so we need to um, ha have the salt there to help us break those down into the savoury peptides and the amino acids. Um, the modern rennets are much better at eliminating the um, the bitter peptides that they used to produce, but um, we do have this issue with with low salt. So with blue cheeses, as I mentioned, if you keep them long enough, they will actually break down and go through most of the bitterness, um, but only if you've got the salt content properly right. Um, there's lots of research going on into the maturing of cheeses and University College Cork and Chagask in um, Ireland are both areas that are doing a lot of work on this. Um, we know that um, if we have things wrong up to this stage, we're, we're just not going to make a, a decent cheese. But um, hopefully with the correct storage we'll get it we'll get a good cheese at the end um and this slide really is just to show this is actually an, a, a, something from my own research where i did some um cross sections of blue uh cheese uh we always thought that the the starter bacteria just died off um, the, the traditional, the lactococci, but actually we discovered on here that um, you can't see it terribly well, but in, in this um, curd particle, around the edge of the curd par particle, once the blue mold starts growing and the pH comes back up, the starter started to grow again. So I just thought I'd put that there as a little um, aside. Um, so the whole thing about maturing it is, is to give us the flavour development. Um, and it's the result of enzymic and metabolic reactions of uh, microorganisms. Um, and it's important to remember it's both starter and non-starter lactic acid bacteria. Um, the the non-starter lactic acid bacteria, I'll call them NS labs for short, um, have been really important over the years. They give traditional variations in the same product from different manufacturers. Modern cleaning, to some extent, has eliminated that, but but it but it is still there because a lot of them are are pretty resistant. Um, and the um, they can give you all sorts of um, flavors. Um, the Sorry, I'm just having to check myself here. Um, the end products might give us bitter flavors. So um, some of the heterofermentative species can give us bitter flavors. Um, and those include um, Lactobacillus casei. Um, two other um, good ones that are non-starter lactic acid bacteria are Lactobacillus plantarium and Lactobacillus pentosus. Um, and they give us, they have a very positive effect. Uh, and they're the homo fermentative ones. So actually, what I'm saying here is if you if you have the facility to check your your uh, non-starter population, um, the homo fermentative homo fermentative species are a positive, and the hetero fermentatives tend to be a negative. Um, so uh, during the development, the, these bacteria are growing uh, and they're influenced by the pH, the oxygen, the AW, all the things that we're used to. And they're competing for nutrients during cell growth. Um, and they will give us then all these um, reactions at the end. So um, various metabolic uh, reactions, and I'll talk later about some of the uh, some of those. So um, as the cells grow, we've got um, we've got 
enzymes take uh, happening. We've got metabolism going on and we've got products being produced. And then as we go into the cell death, the enzymes get released um, and those are going to have an effect as well. And then um, if we've got um, bacteria there that aren't doing anything, there are still enzymes that are being released. Um, and we may well also have yeasts in that mix. Um, and dairy yeasts, uh, Debromyces hanseniae, or otherwise known as Candida formata in different forms, is, is often added to starter mixes. Um, and, and again, in blue cheeses, you may get some that can cause browning, some yeasts. Um, we often see that. So we've got the, the, the main stages here. Um, we've got um, the uh, primary stages, lipolysis, proteolysis, and lactose me me metabolism, and then secondary um, stages, which is the metabolism of the fatty acids and amino acids. Um, this is a complicated um, slide with, uh, with some of the breakdown products, but we've got at the bottom, we've got all these different chemicals that are all going to give us uh, different flavors. And towards the end, I've got a summary slide that, that shows you um, the types of flavors coming from those. So um, the, first, the first part of it is, is the lipolysis. Uh, and as you can see here, we've got our, we've got our tri triglycerides, triacylglycerols being broken down and free fatty acids coming off. And those are really important. Um, and they can then be broken down um, to give us these thioesters, ethyl esters, alkyne one and alkyne two oils. And those are giving us um, fruity aromas. Um, and then also we've got the um, delta fatty acids, del delta lactones, gamma, uh, and they can give us fruity and aromatic flavors. And I'll just give you a list of fatty acids here. Um, and the important ones really for us are uh, on the left, butyric, capric, caprylic, and capric. Um, those are the real important ones because they give us very strong flavors. Um, capric, caprylic, caprylic are the goaty ones. So they, they give us the slightly goaty fatty acids. Um, the capric is, for me, I find capric a very comforting. It's the typical dairy smell um, that you get. And butyric is, is, the, is the rancid note. Um, and then we've got them melting at different times. And the important thing there is that at different times of the year, they, they, there are more or less of these. So if you get more of the hard ones, um, it, as we do in winter, you'll get a harder cheese or a harder butter if you're a butter maker. And in the summer, we get more of the softer ones. And so how, whatever we try, we, we actually get a slightly softer cheese. And that's not a, not a weak curd, but a, a softer body. Um, so there's the, there's the aromas linked to those that I've just talked about, goatee. Um, and you can see those, those butyric, caprylic and caprica, really significant flavors. Um, and then the other thing that people don't think about are the amino acids, and they vary enormously. And actually, some amino acids can be both sweet and sour, um, and, in, and um, glutamic acid is one of those. Um, and what won't surprise you is that glutamic acid is, is what makes MSG. So think of your Chinese sweet and sour. But glutamic acid is also important as a product in cheese because it gives us that marmitiness in a really nice mature cheddar. So um, the microorganisms that are able to break down the amino acids into the amino acids are significant to us to give the sweetness and the marmitiness. Um, and I can't talk much about this slide other than to say, when you get time to look at it, um, it gives you an idea of the amino acids and the, uh, the flavors that, 
they give us. And these are just from the starter bacteria. I haven't, I haven't really talked about uh, the lactobacilli here because they'll give you more or less of other ones, but you can see there um, we've got all sorts of aromas and sulfur, sulfur compounds coming out. So when, when you have a nice mature cheddar and you open it, you often get a little bit of sulfuriness. This list um, gives you some of the compounds that are produced that I've mentioned and some of the aromas that they give you and the cheeses they might be found in. So um, butyric classic Parmesan cheese aroma. Um, uh, if we look at um, ethyl acetate, which is an ester, that's um, a classic Swiss cheese fruity aroma that will come out. Um, methanol from um, a breakdown of an amino acid can be found giving us a baked potato aroma in some, some cheeses. Um, so it's worth taking the time to have a look at that and comparing it with your own cheese, really. This is, this is a slide that's quite nice when you're doing tasting sessions, which isn't so easy across the internet. Um, so we've, we've, I've, I've talked through a lot, um, we're nearing the end. How do we manage it? Well, data, 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 data. You have to record everything. And as you record everything, you start to then be able to understand when things are going wrong. Um, it's, it's hard to, to, um, to monitor all the data, but you know, the more you know, the more you can tweak things. Um, if you, an example of that would be monitoring, monitoring your scold properly on a data management system. You, can, you might go back, for, you might find you've got a slightly weak bodied cheese and go back and say, mm, yes, we actually um, finished the scold half a degree too soon that day, or um, we went too fast or whatever. So, you know, it really is important to, to monitor that data. Um, and then, the, the second major thing for me is, is managing the salt. So um, make sure that you've got consistent curd quality. Now, I've talked about continuous systems here, but actually it applies with everybody. If your curd isn't consistent from day to day, you will not have um, consistent salt content. Um, if you reduce it too much, you'll have bitter cheese. If you've got inconsistent curd, you'll be losing too much moisture, you'll have inconsistent salt and you'll have bitter cheese again. Um, you need to make sure that your, um, if, you, if you're checking your casein that you can keep your starter and rennet um, appropriate according to the casein content. Um, make sure that you're mixing your salt properly. Uh, very often that's an area that is missed or, or especially if you start to, to uh, mechanize it. Make sure that when you mill your curd, the chip sizes are even. Um, and then one of the things that's come on in the last 10 years is the use of new types of um, salt that actually work just as well. And one that's being used quite a bit is, is something called soda low, which has a low sodium, but actually works well in cheese. Um, and then the other thing, which is very good for artisan cheese making, is um, try using sea salt because that's often um, very good and gives you a good salt content, but it has different minerals in there. So it is, a, it is really important. Um, if you're making soft cheese, um, again, make sure your salting method is consistent. Are you spreading it on? really giving us sorry yeah, just keep going Liz okay yeah. this this um, slide just gives you a list of um, traditional faults in cheese that I've talked about so weak body is a real issue um, and um, 
just going through the list, misshapen cheese. Um, if your cheese is too warm when you take it out of the presses, it will it will uh, not keep its shape properly. So um, it's it's um, usually caused by it being too warm going into the presses. Can be a problem in summer. Open texture, um, probably caused by coliform organisms. Discoloration, a big issue with artisan cheese where you've got uneven salting or over acid and so you get marbling in the cheese. Uh, and then if you're if you're storing traditionally in in bandage wrapped cheeses, you may get cracks forming, which is a bit of an issue. Um, if you're if you're wanting to show the cheese particularly um, and then um, over acid cheeses will sometimes give you a, a, a weeping curd as well. So there are opportunities um, and um, those opportunities I've covered at some length um, and to summarize them it's try new site new types of salt if you want to to reduce the sodium levels try new starter mixes um, and certainly make sure you've got uh, duplicates of those so that you can change your your rotation um, and you can just change your recipe slightly and find you've got a whole new cheese and one thing that covid has taught us is that um, actually there's a lot of innovation that we can do um, and, and, and it gives us more saleable product. Uh, and then we've got better starters out there to give us different flavors. So, you know, give, give, them, give some of them a try if you want to do. So in summary, um, I, what 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 I've said really is um, there are lots and lots of things that will affect our uh, uh, our cheese and give us challenges. But if we if we just control each one by one percent, very quickly we're making a twenty percent improvement on our cheese. So try monitoring those things and improving the very small things um, and you should see a big quality improvement um, but my biggest caveat is is um, actors always say never work with children and animals and I would add bacteria into that so we don't always know what what they're going to do to us uh, and they'll always give us surprises thank you very much beautiful thank you Liz um, so we have got a couple of questions here, if you'd like to open your chat box, maybe yeah. stop sharing. Um, what I would last, like to ask our participants is, has anyone experienced um, something positive about changing the type of salt that you use in making your cheese? Has um, changing the salt made a difference? So I put one question up there. We've still got Ian with us, which is good. So he's obviously enjoying the webinar. Okay. I'll, uh, thank you very much, Ian. Fantastic webinar. Hope hope you don't drop out. Well, I live in Cornwall, which is probably like Tasmania. So I'm afraid I dropped out. So Liz has just dropped out again. Um, he's Ian. Okay. <laughs> Pasteurization for um Sorry, Liz, you, you did just drop out again. So um, <laughs> could you read that question again, please? Yes. Um what temp time and temperature combination would you consider for over pasteurization? Um legally the, the we're required to be 71.74 15 seconds yeah. uh, as it was, but actually for cheese it used to be probably 7071. 70, 70, um, uh, and I think, well, there isn't still no legal requirement to pasteurize for cheese making. That's why we've got all these raw milk cheeses. I would say once you get up to 73, you are over pasteurizing. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of companies, a lot of small cheese makers are having to manage with that. Uh, and the bacteria, um, 
The bacteria I mentioned was Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, which is linked with uh, Crohn with Yona's disease in cattle, um, and that there is a suggestion that might be linked with Crohn's disease in humans. But because we have the acidity of cheese making, um, that's our control factor, which is why we, you know, as long as we're checking the milk, um, then that's our control factor. Very good. Can you see Ian's video there? He's... I can, yes. <laughs> I can't, is it sheep on there? Goats. Goats, ah, oh, lovely, excellent. Sorry, it's very small and I, it's very early in the morning here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we've got another question uh, that says, what is the relation between moisture in cheese and salt addition, salt addition during dry salting on soft cheese? Does salt affect moisture or the other way around? Um, what about the role of cheese prior, PHBH prior to salt addition? Okay, lots of questions there. Um, if your moisture is high, what will happen is the salt will dissolve in the moisture and run out of the cheese. So actually ensuring that your moisture is correct before you salt is the important factor. Um, if you, the, the salt will, will affect the moisture clearly because the salt's drawing the moisture out of the cheese. But if if you've got too much moisture there, then you're losing salt as well. So they are, they're interconnected really. Um, the, the role of the cheese pH prior to salt addition is important insofar as um, if, the, if, the pH, if you're making a soft cheese, which I think you're probably looking here, yes. Um, if your pH isn't low enough, your curd won't be very robust anyway. So it's all about getting the curd formation right um, so that you're not washing salt down the drain effectively. Um, because you'll just end up with a low salt cheese. I'm not sure whether that answers your question. So if it doesn't, please put a, an additional one in. So we've got an <laughs> Ian. <laughs> Jenny, and, and, do you want me to read that, Jenny? Oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> so this is other Ian, I think Bay of Fires Ian, who said, um, generally from mill and salt, how long to press in cloth brown cheddar? Um, oh, from, from milling, it's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Normally we go from renneting is where I would start. And I would say with a cheddar, it wants to be to, between four and four and a quarter hours from renneting to pressing. Oh, I'm glad you use sea salt. Um, and uh, you presumably have to leave it on the curd a little to let it um, settle in. Well, one of the issues I haven't talked about is is um, the, the, is modern salt. We used to use um, dendritic salt, which was a, a flat salt, and that went into the curd very well. Then they discovered that the process they were using to make it was carcinogenic, so that went out of the window, and we all had to use um, uh, square salt, um, and that doesn't go into the curd so well, so you have to put the salt on and let it rest before you start mixing it in. It's a bit like that with sea salt because it doesn't dissolve quite, if you're using big granules, it doesn't dissolve quite as well. I believe dendritic salt's back again now, but. Um, so Ian's just. So as Ian's put from salting to press, that's, um, I would let it rest 10 minutes and then mix it in well. So I probably take, depending on the amount of curd I've got, obviously, I, I'll, I'll sprinkle it on, I'll, I'll mill it, salt it, let it rest for 10 minutes, uh, and then feel if it's gone in. You can tell if it's gone in by hand because you'll feel the grittiness if it hasn't, and then it can go into the press. Well, that's terrific. Well, there don't seem to be any more questions. So with that, I'll finish this webinar. But Liz, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah, it's um, really fantastic. Are you happy 
if people email you if they have further questions. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So contact me if you'd like Lisa's, um, Lisa's um, details and I can send them on. All righty. Thank so you very much, everybody.